Welcome to Casa Conversations. I'm Brian Bondari, current president of the Composers Alliance of San Antonio. Casa, as our name implies, is a nonprofit organization comprised of composers dedicated to the promotion of new music in and around San Antonio, Texas. Our membership, though largely concentrated in San Antonio, ranges across several U.S. states and even a few other countries, such as Spain and Mexico. Our goal with CASA Conversations is to hold interesting discussions within our own membership and also with prominent musicians in and around San Antonio. Our first interviewee is Charles Goodyear, long-standing member and current CASA treasurer. At age 88, Charles has a keen mind and remains active, not only as a performer and teacher, but also physically. I hope I can still play tennis when I'm 88. Charles has had a long and varied career, and despite earning a living in biochemistry and molecular biology, which remain interests of his, as you will undoubtedly discover in our discussion, music has remained for him a lifelong passion. To that end, it's not inaccurate to compare him to someone like Alexander Borodin, or perhaps Charles Ives, as one who earned a living in a drastically unrelated field, yet who never gave up his study of music, nor his ambition to create it. One final note, despite the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, neither of us wore masks during this interview. Initially, I asked Charlie if he wanted to conduct the interview over video chat, but he requested that I come to his house instead. Charlie has received the COVID vaccine, and I had a negative COVID test the day prior to our meeting. Though few things in life are risk-free, we both agreed that our meeting was low risk enough not to warrant masks. That said, there were no handshakes or hugs, regrettably. And with that, let's begin the conversation. So, yeah, well, okay, so I had my, my other career. Oh, well, I could mention my Navy career. Okay. I was in the Navy for 13 years, regular Navy plus reserves. Well, we'll and get to that. I mean, that's, uh, you, know, it's, you can always cut and edit. Of course, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Well, hi, Charlie. Hi. <laughs> well, one, one bit of record keeping here at the beginning. All right. Um, Charles or Charlie? Uh, well, either one, but... Uh, you know, uh, what would you prefer? I've always thought of you as Charlie for some reason. Do it. Maybe Do after it. Heard I mean, I am kind Charlie of a Charlie. I'm times. kind of a Charlie. My wife calls me Charlie. And uh, I mean, she can be very authoritative with well, that there we particular go. word. Well, good. Well, I mean, that way she doesn't have to say Charles like my mother. You know, she would always <laughs> say Charles. All right. <laughs> <laughs> What's your middle name, Charles? Thomas. Thomas. CTG, that is a uh, codon for a, uh, an amino acid. Is it? That goes into protein, yeah. I think it's serine. Uh, but anyway. Uh, it's over my head. So over anyway. Head. Well, thanks but, uh, for agreeing to, to talk with us like this. It's, I've been hoping to have a conversation like this with you for a while. So well, that's awfully nice. Yeah. It really is. Well, I think I met you. I came to San Antonio in... 2011, and 2011. Then you pretty soon after that. Yeah, yeah. And you were in, you must have been in your late 70s at that time? Is that well, right? how many years ago was that? I'm 88 right now. So that is uh, that, nine. This would have been al almost 10 years ago. Yeah. I came here well, in August. Yeah. So I would be 78 if it was almost 10 years mm -hmm. ago, or 76. 77. Uh, but uh, 78, yeah. How long ago? Oh my gosh. In that, but in many ways, a flick in time, and just a blick in time, a blink. Yeah. Mm. Well, in many ways. So I met you, of course, at a CASA meeting. That was how we, yeah. how we're acquainted here. But I understand that you've had a long and varied career, because um, your PhD is in biochemistry. Biochemistry, right? yes. When when did you complete that degree? I completed that in sixty one. In 61. And where was that? Uh, that was from Cal Berkeley, Berkeley, California. Okay. 
I never actually stood up t to wear that fancy gown and go through graduation. I just, as soon as I got the okay on my thesis, I went off and got a job. I had three children <laughs> and a hungry, hungry bunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have three children now too, and I understand so, hungry bunch. So I went, uh, uh, and I had uh, gone on an interview trip. Uh, you know, in those days, it was really nice, I'm going to tell you. Uh, the uh, the school, I mean, the uh, faculty advisor and other, in this, they would, um, uh, well, what is your interest? What do you want to do? And so I uh, actually, I, I decided not to go into academia because I I didn't think I could afford to live on a postdoc's salary. And, um, but, uh, so then I, uh, I went on an interview trip from, I, I was living in Oakland at the time. And um, uh, I visited um, three or four pharmaceutical companies, like DuPont, because that's a chemical company, but they have a pharmaceutical act. Bent to them, and Pfizer, and Abbott, and uh, Lilly, and Kodak. Now, I, oh, I know why I went to Kodak. I, I had an interview there, but um, <laughs> I, I, I always had my eye on the Eastman School of Music, mm -hmm. and uh, my teacher uh, uh, didn't graduate from there, but she'd go up there for summer summers, you know, and she'd just talk about Rochester and all that. So when I saw that I could interview at Kodak, that's where I interviewed, and um, I, inter I think maybe that was one of my, one of my first interviews, and um, they just were so nice. And they wanted to give me money, <laughs> and they wanted to give me a laboratory. You know, it was really nice. And so I said, "This is this is a dream come true." I never have lived in that area, in uh, uh, the New York State, and uh, this is right on the Great Lakes. You know, on Lake Ontario, mm -hmm. we lived a large part of our time on right on Lake Ontario. Kids loved it, uh, and uh, but I got in. To Kodak, and they, they just wanted me right away, so that's why I came. I came to Rochester in November 1960. There was snow on the ground, and it was gray, and the snow was dirty. And I had just left sunny California, yeah. Berkeley, which is like, yeah. you know, it's like heaven it's on earth. I, shock. I really didn't want to leave California, I can tell you that. I really didn't want to leave. I, th you know, we had this joke. Maybe we could sell pencils on the street or something like that. But um, there weren't any, at that time, the pharmaceutical industry was most on, most on the East Coast and uh, up in the, uh, you know, the, uh, around the Great Lakes and so on. So, But anyway, uh, so I didn't interview all the places I could. I just, uh, I got a good offer from Kodak and I just took it and I said, that's where I want to be. Yeah, so you leave... Berkeley, California in 1961, and yeah. you end up in Rochester, New York, Rochester, at Kodak. New York. Now, okay. most of us think of Kodak as a film, a camera company, uh, yes. but apparently there's more to it. Oh, there's a lot more. Uh, uh, they're, uh, they were uh, really uh, big in organic chemistry research, physics research, uh, inorganic chemistry, analytical chemistry. But not biochemistry, not biological chemistry. So it appears that they were ready to maybe take a step in that direction. But um, I was actually hired not in the Kodak proper, but in a subsidiary Kodak, which was called Distillation Products. Very interesting company, small company, full of kind of mavericks, and I just loved it. Was I was a maverick too, <laughs> in a way. <laughs> I was accused of wearing sandals in the lab and things like that. Come out of Berkeley. So. Yeah. Now I, I had, and I, <laughs> anyway, it was fun. But um, um, distillation products uh, did a number of things. But one of the things that, that I knew them from is that they were the uh, home of Eastman Chemicals uh, and Eastman Laboratory Chemicals, and and. It, you know, when you do research in uh, various areas, and you need you need a you know you need a bottle of uh, 
cupric sulfate or something like that. Okay, how do you get it? Well, you can get it from uh, Eastman, actually mostly organic, so that's, that's an inorganic. But anyway, so they had this sterling reputation. So that was, a, that was kind of a subsidiary of distillation products. The main thing they did is they actually distilled things. And um, it was a result of some very inventive person who was working in the main chemistry laboratories of Kodak who wanted to find a way to uh, purify the uh, organic dyes that go into color film. It's very difficult. So he did a high vacuum built a high vacuum machine with a spinning disc and a, a very short path to the uh, from the disc to the uh, condensing area okay and so they built big machines and anyway so he he, he could purify purify his uh, photographic chemicals that way uh, I, mean, I mean there's so much to talk about but purifying uh, just purifying the results of your Laboratory work is sometimes the worst <laughs> possible thing and they had all kinds of interesting apparatus but um, anyway, so this guy uh, Started distilling other things it's one of the after his dyes. He's distilled Shark liver oil huh. now. Why did he do that? Well, it turns out shark liver oil is a great source of pure vitamin A and In those days vitamin A was hugely expensive so they built these big oil tanks and they imported shark liver oil from Alaska, I think, and other places. And we had, so we used to say the cats know where that oil is. Yeah, but they, uh, it was sort of a fishy smell, you know. Yeah. But this pure vitamin A, I mean, it became so cheap, they could actually, not only did it go into pharmaceuticals, but it was used to inject cattle and other livestock so that they wouldn't be deficient in uh, vitamin that A. particular thing, yeah. So you can pick up vitamin A by eating alfalfa and stuff like that. But, but uh, uh, if, if they were just, you know, on a certain diet that was, so they could uh, improve the uh, productivity of the cows. And then he tried, he uh, distilled um, what was called uh, kind of a, it was the mash, left after you extract oils like uh, salad uh, dressing oil or like if you take um, say wheat germ oil and extract it you get um, wheat, germ oil, wheat germ oil but uh, you um, the what's left over is is uh, high in vitamin E so he distilled that and lo and behold he got pure vitamin E which was just I mean it was such a chemical process to to purify natural natural products to get pure vitamin E. And so he had pure vitamin E. And I remember when I went to, uh, the guys were showing me around the lab, they took me, this guy took me to the refrigerator and he showed me some crystals of vitamin E. I said, that's impossible, it's an oil. He says, well, if you get it pure and you cool it down enough, you can get crystals. So anyway, my <laughs> to make a long story short, my first job was to find out what the biological uh, uh, myth, uh, uh, what was the um, the reason that vitamin E was a vitamin, mm -hmm. okay? So that was unknown. So that's like a gift. I mean, I, I, had a, I got an open ticket to just whatever I could think of to find out what the real reason vitamin E was required in human nutrition. Okay, so I spent a lot of time with that, and then, um, I had in my thesis I had studied another vitamin. It's a B vitamin, and I had determined the metabolism of this vitamin. And so when you know, it, when it goes into your body, how it's converted into well, where it goes to have its activity, and then what happens to it, because everything that goes in has to come out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. either as gas or uh, some other chemical that's converted to. So I determined the intermediary metabolism is called of pantothenic acid, which is a component of um, coenzyme A, which doesn't mean anything to you probably, but coenzyme A is uh, at the fundamental pathways in many, many biological reactions like synthesis of fat from um, a dietary 
sorcerers, even from glucose, even. So, so that was exciting, and uh, and uh, I learned a technique there from a guy. Uh, he was an Israeli scientist. And scientist. His name was Ben Volcani, and he had hair, hair which went up like this. <laughs> he was a great. He was a character, and uh, but he took me uh, in, and he showed me how to um, isolate from nature uh, microorganisms that could uh, metabolize organic molecules. And so I uh, isolated some organisms that uh, would, uh, you might say, eat or digest, but anyway, they would metabolize panathenic acid for uh, whatever they needed. And panathenic acid has no nitrogen in it, so you cook, you, you cook up a kind of a, a soup for them, the bacteria, after you isolate them. It's kind of a tricky thing. But you end up with a pure colony. I think I can't even remember. I think it was a pseudomonas. That doesn't mean anything to you either. But it was a pseudomonas. I think it was. Uh, it wasn't the root genosa. Pseudomonas. Well, anyway, that was the the genus. And so when I uh, the first thing I thought I got I had to find out what the metabolism of vitamin E is. And so I set about uh, uh, working on that, and I put on my lab coat like Ben taught me to do, and I had a mason jar and a spoon or a trowel or something. I went down to the Genesee River and other places around and gathered uh, actually mud. And you go through a lot of, you have to be patient, but you can get pure, you know, a whole mess of, mess of microorganisms and in pure form, and then you have to identify them and so on and so forth. But, so, but the trick with the vitamin E was, I mean, it was a little difficult because it's an oil, doesn't mix with water. But so when you culture microorganisms, you generally have to have a water solution. So that's, that was a trick, and I solved that by basically adding some detergent. Um, uh, kind of sophisticated, but I could mix it in, and so I could get it dispersed pretty finely in the uh, and then uh, when I uh, and I made up this soup, and I got some really nice microorganisms, and uh, to make it uh, the story short, well, then I had to isolate uh, materials from the from the, <laughs> from the from the mixture, and so I found one new compound, never been found before, that was uh, a metabolite of uh, vitamin E. And I, you know, it looked to me like that could act as a coenzyme. And uh, of course, <clears throat> um, you know, it, it really uh, it was kind of exciting. And so I published this stuff. So I, I, I kind of got a name in vitamin E. And, um, but the other aspect of it was um, <clears throat> vitamin E what is a natural compound. And it's, I, I don't have a, I used to have a, Chemical. Oh, here. Maybe it says some vitamin E up here. Would you like to have a little vitamin? Sure. Maybe you can reach this. Oh, oh, there it is. You got it? There's vitamin E. My gosh, it's lost one of its hydrogens. Uh. But uh, <laughs> here, here, this is the vitamin E. And uh, there, uh, there are three. Uh, somebody put this together wrong. But anyway, <laughs> I wouldn't know. This is, this is, um, yeah, this should be over here. How did they do that? Must have been a kid. I sometimes give it to the. I used to give it to my piano students. I might explain the missing hydrogen. But anyway, yeah, they probably took it home. So this is. I spent a lot of time on this and uh, this molecule. This is a, a six-membered ring, and this is a carbon, uh, uh, carbon chain with. It's got, uh, I think, maybe we have lost some of it anyway, but it's got, uh, nature makes it in a special way. So there's right-handed and left-handed in nature, you know, mm -hmm. just like we have in our hands. Our molecules are like that. And for something uh, to be active in some biological process, you have to have the right, uh, we call them enantiomers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a good word, right? Enantiomers. You can make a musical composition. You know, <laughs> and then enantiomeric. I never thought of that. 
But I guess, anyway, you do left hand, that's an enantiomer, and right hand. But anyway, um, so in vitamin E, there are three handedness centers. And so nature makes them perfectly. And, but if you try to synthesize them chemically, you get a mixture of right hand and left hand at every center. So, so uh, uh, the, our main competitor, uh, Hoffner Roach, was making vitamin E um, synthetically, and that had, uh, you know, what's not you couldn't purify it, and uh, you know it's like uh, two to the third power, I think. So it's like eight different isomers of vitamin E. So, so. Uh, uh, Codex, I mean, Distillation Products spent a lot of time showing how natural vitamin E was so much better and more active and so on and so forth and, and then the um, the synthetic compound. But uh, so one of my things, was, one of my uh, jobs was to go to uh, scientific meetings and show the data, how this was this, was this, and this. I learned one thing in this, you know, that I never forgotten, and that is, I, I you know, one, th one one reason I wanted to go into science was, was because data is data, and fact is fact, and so on and so forth, and there's truth, and you, you know, you cannot manipulate the truth, but in fact you can. <laughs> <laughs> and so this, company, so the the Hoff and the Rose guys would take their data and. And, you know, they would massage it and so on and so forth. And pretty soon it looked a lot better than it was. And I'd be in the back of the room and I'd raise my hand and I'd say, just a minute, you know. And so <laughs> I would uh, show my data and I would refute it and I would point out these things. But, um, I mean, we were all friendly about it. But uh, it was, uh, uh, so that was my lesson in, in data management. You can do a lot with data. And it depends on kind of like what you're... Uh, if you wish for a certain result, you might be able to mm, massage show the data yeah. enough to get there. But anyway, um, uh, you know that you can only do so much of that, and eventually the truth has to come out. But um, so that was my vitamin E event, adventure, and um, I had to. Uh, when you grow large quantities of microorganism, you use what's called a fermenter, and it's like a big pot. With a stirrer in it, it's like a chemical uh, um, uh, um, it's like a kettle okay and, and mm -hmm. it's but it it can be enclosed sometimes it's open but when it from when you do uh, culture of bacteria you've got to have it closed and it has to be sterile as someone who brews beer I'm quite fond oh yeah of it's, you, you understand things. you understand yes. okay so it's exactly the same thing okay so um, they had Eastman Organic Chemicals. They had a a big well, so you know, sort of a manufacturing plant. And I, my, I had an, a buddy who wanted to work with me. He says, let's go over there and see if we can get them to convert one of their reactors to a fermenter. And so we did. <laughs> but sterilizing it was a bit dicey. We couldn't use, uh, the, uh, you know, one of the standard ways to sterilize is using uh, high pressure steam. But uh, we couldn't do that with these. And also there are all kinds of places where you can get into trouble with non-sterile openings and mm -hmm. con connectors and things like this. But the fact that I, this organism that I had wanted to grow in there was um, a very, um, uh, you know, it had an appetite for vitamin E and other um, organisms that might come in like or E. coli and yeast even stuff right. like that. Yeah, wild yeast. It would not, it would not touch it. So in a way, it had a, it had a kind of a built-in way. So we we grew large quantities of this thing. Of course, we had a lot of fun and got a lot of notoriety for doing this. But um, later on in life, in the I I had actual fermenters and I had that was one of my one of my goals as I was developing Kodak. I wanted to build a big plant. You know, I wanted to have a big plant that would do something that um, would make stuff that I had, you know, had participated in. So eventually they did. They built a plant in Iowa to make lysine, of all things, hmm. for cattle feed. I had very little to do with it, but I did, you know, I, I laid the groundwork for them to be interested in 
this method of, of uh, manufacturing chemicals. So, so uh, but we did have a big pilot plant. We built a pilot plant with, uh, well, let's see. First of all, I had a thousand liters. That was, that was my kind of, that's like the intermediate or the, maybe the beginning level. Then you, the next level is 10,000 liters. And production is, you know, 50 to 100,000 liters. Big fermenters. It's really amazing what you could do. But all that came out of, you know, the seeds I planted. I was yeah. so, so happy about that because that was one goal. And um, I had another goal, which I could talk about. And that was, I was one of the things that fascinated me about biochemistry was enzymes. How can enzymes be so specific and how they can, how can they uh, do what they do? They're catalysts, you know, and they just do amazing things. Of course, we live because enzymes of our enzyme components and stuff like that. So, and uh, so I thought, I want to, I would like to see an enzyme. See, you know, have a, a structure like this or something like that. So I realized that I, I I can show you a picture. I have it back there of my the organism that uh, was growing on this particular thing, and then the, this is just one enzyme that came out. They finally got the structure of it after I left the company. I, it took almost fifty years to get that structure. <laughs> but anyway, so um, uh, but so I was able to see it, you know, and it. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, I, I'm simplifying a lot of things, but so I can, uh, this, this particular enzyme uh, catalyzes things in water that would normally only be catalyzed in organic solvents, where the water isn't there because water messes up the reaction. But this enzyme that nature kind of uh, developed out of my work um, can do this, and so it has... And it's, you can see how it works and you know all the bonding and the, the uh, way that molecules fit in there so they can react and things like this without water being there. This particular enzyme was used uh, by uh, another subsidiary of Kodak, which I worked for for a while after I left Kodak, called Genencore. Mm -hmm. And Genencore was, I mean, as you might expect, uh, was heavily involved in genetics and uh, molecular biology. So I became a molecular biologist after a while. But um, the, um, uh, <laughs> I'm just rambling on, you're gonna have to cut oh, a lot of this fine. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is, I mean, I got excited about this. But I, uh, one of the things I wanted to know after I, 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 I left um, distillation products because, um, uh, I felt that I wasn't getting paid enough there, <laughs> so I let it be known. <laughs> yeah, not worth your while. Yeah. I said, I, you know, um, so I actually went, I got another job in California. <laughs> oh, you made it back. Yeah, well, I never got to that job because the people in the main Kodak laboratory got wind of it, and they called the people back oh, no. and told them that I was coming, but they didn't want me to come. And uh, they would take care of me. They said, I mean, I essentially walked out of the company. They put me back in and said, if you'll stay, you can now work in the main research labs, which is like, you know, maybe going to heaven. You know, I mean, the main research labs, which are, wow, we're they're equipped with everything. And, uh, and we'll give you a raise, but you keep quiet about it. Because you're not supposed to do that sort of thing. <laughs> but... You know, but it was enough to keep you yeah, in Rochester. Oh yeah, yeah, and kept me there. And I really wanted to stay in Rochester because, well, I was, I was taking classes at the Eastman School at that time. I was, um, going in the, uh, you know, I actually in those days, surprising how much freedom you had if you could be productive. And I gradually got a a group that was working for me and stuff like that, so I could. Set them to work, get them going, and I go over to the Eastman School and study theory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or some, wow. I even took piano lessons over there, <laughs> and um, I studied orchestration over, mm -hmm. uh, with so, Samuel Adler, I presume. Well, I didn't study with Samuel because um, 
Well, uh, I, when I walked in the school, uh, who was this guy, Wright? He was the guy that ran the band, or the uh, Eastman, uh, Eastman, uh, uh, what they call it? Wind Ensemble? Wind Ensemble, yeah. And uh, I had to score with me, and uh, handwritten, and I was, you know, going around, and I wanted to talk to somebody, and so he... He says, well, come on in my office. So he took the score and, um, you know, he just looked at it. And, of course, I was blown away. I, I was a little bit, uh, well, I felt like an infant in there, I'll tell you that. But he took the score and read it, you know, and, and I thought, well, how can he do that? I mean, he's doing all this, you know, and he's, he says, well, that's, that's pretty good. And uh, he said, do you ever think of um, going to school here, you know? And I said, yeah, I thought of it. But uh, right now, I'm uh, pretty much involved in working. I can take, you know, individual classes. Yeah, on the side. And, uh, and well, actually, previous to this, when Howard, Howard Hansen was there, uh -huh. when I, he wasn't, um, I think he was retired. Yeah, he had just retired about the time I got there, but he had been at the school for a long, long time. And, you know, he was such a beloved person in the community. Howard Hansen was just, I mean, and of course he was a character too. I mean, he had this really nice beard and stuff like that. He looked the part. And, um, and he was very vocal about his stuff. And, um, but so I just, uh, earlier, this is before I went to the school with my score, I sent a score to uh, Howard Hansen. <laughs> so... <laughs> uh, and so uh, he actually looked at it and sent it back to me. It was a set of variations I did. For piano? Uh, yeah, for piano. I just, I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, I had taken, um, you know, I, was, I had just gone through uh, studying uh, one of Beethoven's set of variations, and I was fascinated by it. So, so maybe I'll, see, I'll try something like that. So I picked a really simple theme in C with very little... I mean, I think there may be three chords, it's just to see what I could do with it. And so then I did all this stuff, you know, and some of it. And uh, I had done some of that earlier when I was in the Navy, by the way. I used to take my, I had a sketchbook, and I would sketch in the, when I would go ashore or something like that. So, um, but anyway, so I put this together as a set of variations, sent it to Howard Hansen. <laughs> he sent it back, he said, you must go to school here. So the idea was planted. The other person that planted that idea was my wife, Margaret. She said, you know you want to go to school there. Why don't you just do it? And I said, well, I'm 60 years old. <laughs> you have one of the, one of the most renowned music schools in your backyard. Oh, yeah. I mean, there it is. And, I'm, and of course, I've been, you know, piling around, jumping around. And I was... I was active in the music community too. I was um, there. There were two really good community orchestras, and um, I, but one was a little above the other, you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I got in the the one that was a little bit lower, and uh, I was percussion, but I did also you play the piano, but <laughs> so percussion. I mean, that was pretty. I never studied percussion at all, but <laughs> I faked it. But I, then I started writing for the orchestra. I thought, well, I've got my or my orchestra here. Why don't I just see if I can orchestrate something or maybe make an orchestra piece? So I, I started doing these orchestra pieces, uh, simple pieces, like I did a suite of, uh, I call it the uh, Athenian suite, I guess, because they named their high schools around there after uh, Greek figures. You know, mm -hmm. there's a there's Olympia High School and there's Athena High School and stuff like that. So I thought, and we practiced in these high school, in the high school auditoriums, and so I, I had this Athenian suite, and I did some dances and stuff like that, and they played these, and, um, you know, they enjoyed it, and I enjoyed it, <laughs> so... Yeah. Well, Charlie, you, <clears throat> clearly you didn't start your musical career at 60, right? I mean, no. so you're an unusual biochemist in that you also had this lifelong love and passion for music simultaneously yeah, yeah simultaneously. and so and you mentioned your career in the navy as well it's yeah. an unusual person who will have these 
yeah. career paths, but also maintain an interest in music. Can you talk about music in your youth? Well, my God, music was, uh, it was so important to me. I can't just, I just, you know, I, uh, I, uh, my first lesson was when I was five and my, we have a family of, um, there were three kids at that time. My sister, who was a year older than me and, uh, my brother who was a three years younger. And, um, so my sister was going to take piano lessons, you know. My mother was a, she was a really good singer. Kind of a mezzo mm -hmm. singer, and man, what her voice would just charmed me. My dad, uh, he was a closet violin player, and I never knew that until <laughs> later. But, um, but anyway, so uh, we had a um, grand piano in the house, and I used to listen to my mom. She'd put us to bed, and then she'd play the piano. And um, she had a few things she would like, just piano, and then, but she would be singing too. And us kids, <laughs> bring us back. <laughs> anyway, good memories. Yeah. So uh, she would sing, and we'd sit up at the top of the stairs. <laughs> anyway, so, and we, we had, you know, um, I mean, it, it, this was in the 40s. This was, um, I was, I was, no, I was in the 30s. I was 38, 1938, 1938. This guy came to our door. His name was Emery Brennan. He was the piano teacher. And so he set up my, my sister Lois Ann, and he was doing it, you know, showing her. What he and I was right there with my nose on the keyboard. I was, you know, about this high. And, you know, I, and so... I just, I just wouldn't go away, and I, I, and then, and so you know, but anyway, so I just begged my mom to to get piano lessons, and uh, and uh, this guy didn't want to take me because you know you can barely read. How can you play the piano? <laughs> but anyway, he took me, and so my sister and I started at about the same time, and we took lessons. Till uh, I guess I we left Emory Brennan at uh, 1945, right after oh it's 1946, right after the war was over. Mm -hmm. and, but he you know, he was an interesting guy. He would I still remember him. I could draw a picture of him. He came <laughs> and he he'd give a lesson, and then um, after he had finished, he would sit down and he'd play something, and you know he'd play a Chopin etude or. I played a lot of Chopin, and he just played so beautifully, you know, and he was, you know, boy, talk about capturing the, the young person, you know, who was interested in music. So, and he, he treated us to a lot of music, and um, um, that sister and I used to play duets, and we had a great time. Uh, you know, I... Uh, I'd like to push her off the bench everywhere. She was, <laughs> she was such a proper lad, proper girl. She's so proper, like my mother. My mother was proper too. But anyway, so we we grew up together playing, uh, taking piano lessons. And then uh, when I left, we had my oh, after the war, my dad he was working for the Department of Agriculture. And he made a big name for himself. Actually, he was a famous man. It's a whole another story. Mm. I was in my youth. I was used to having famous people in the house in the in the chemistry field, <laughs> and um, you know, I just thought, okay, that's my dad. But anyway, so um, we moved. He wanted to. He said he wanted to move someplace to raise children. He didn't want to raise children in this uh, Washington suburb area. So that's what they wanted to do. So we went to this little town in Kansas, northeast. Uh, or Southeast Kansas. It had 5,000 people in it. And I was, you know, used to, I, my mother would take me to, uh, she'd take us kids to Washington to the art, you know, the art scene, the museum mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And we'd go to concerts. What was the town? Uh, DC, Washington, DC. Oh, oh the no, town. In Kansas. Oh, in Kansas. It was called Neodice. 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 Which in Indian means the meeting of the waters or something like that. But anyway, it was the home of a big uh, petroleum company. And, uh, no, it wasn't a petroleum company. It was, uh, very strange. Uh, 
Uh, in those days, uh, uh, one of the ma- main feed for cattle was alfalfa. Mm-hmm. And this guy in the town had developed a way to dry alfalfa so that it wouldn't spoil. Because alfalfa, alfalfa uh, once you cut it, you know, if you don't yeah. take good care of it, it, it'll rot. I mean, it'll ferment, actually. I used but to have I, a pet rabbit, and we would feed him dried alfalfa grass. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, so that was a big business. And they wanted to, to start a business that my, my dad had really start he had started for the and during the war and it was a big thing huge and so a lot of companies wanted to do that after the war and there was a uh bridgeport brass in connecticut wanted him and then other people wanted him he says i want to go someplace where the the children can thrive imagine so he took he went to this sort of out uh they started a company named it uh it was called the uh, Aerosol Incorporated. And uh, so he, he stayed there for about, let's see, I was, um, uh, I had just started high school. I was in the eighth grade or something. But I didn't go to the eighth grade. I skipped the eighth grade. They didn't have one. Huh. Uh, no, I, no, wait a minute. I take that back. I had to go to the eighth grade. My sister didn't. Uh, yeah, she was smart. <laughs> anyway, but I so I I think I was uh, at, at the last half of the eighth grade in this little town, and uh, and I stayed there till I was. Um, we stayed there two and a half years, I think. And uh, my uh, my dad got an offer from Phyllis Petroleum Company, which was a bigger company, and they wanted to do research in various things like that. So my dad was a I mean, he had a hundred patents by that time, and uh, so um, I, w- I had to get a hundred patents. I never made it, oh. but I did make uh, fifty-five. That's... <laughs> anyway, fifty-five so... more than I have. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, my so we were, went to Phyllis Petroleum, and, and, and I, I had a music. I had a piano teacher in in Yodice, but I couldn't stand him. He he, I mean, I just couldn't stand him, so I shifted to the clarinet huh. because I couldn't stand it. You know, I just it didn't. After Emory Brennan, you know, mm-hmm. but you know, I was a kid, and so I took the clarinet for a while. But I didn't really like the clarinet either. But I did take. But um, so um, that was kind of a fallow time for me musically. But we moved to um, Bartlesville, Oklahoma, which was a hotbed of music. I mean. And the music teachers there were uh, top notch, and they were competitive too. And so you had to uh, to get you had to um, you know um, try out for do a, what do you call it uh, audition. audition. I had to audition. <laughs> yeah. So so I I had what did I audition with? I think it was clarinet. Um, no, I didn't audition with the clarinet, <laughs> but I. Um, I had a piece, I think it was, you know, it, you probably played it, Russell of Spring. That was the piece I had. And I had it memorized. And so I just played it for Martha. Her name was Martha Boucher. And uh, we hit it off. We just hit it off. I mean, she was like, almost like a second mother to me. We just, I mean, we became, um, I mean, she taught me till I went to college. And... Um, I, every time I came home, I'd visit her, you know. I showed her my first baby, you know, mm. stuff like that. So she was precious to me. And what a piano player she was, oh my God. She would, she's the kind that could substitute for a concerto when they, when one of the players was sick somewhere else, you know. Ringer, yeah. Yeah, and so I, you know, and I said, how do you do that? He says, well, you work really hard, she said. <laughs> but, you know, it reminds me, I've got a, I've got a book here. That was her book. Where is that? Uh, I just pulled it out the other day. Oh yeah, here it is, Ravel. You can see her name on the on the top of it. Oh, here. I do. Yeah. Martha M. Boucher. Mm-hmm. Well, when she died. Nice handwriting too. I, you know, she was she was a she was something else. But she um, uh, when when she died, I was uh, in Rochester at the time, and all all. I, all of her students that were around there got together and they divided up her music collection and sent it to people who had studied with it. So I got 
about four books from her. And I saw this Ravel thing, I think. I mean, they, somebody just mailed it to me. And uh, so uh, was one of my, I was thinking about that the other day, and I thought, one of my adult students, I said, you I just you got to learn to play this Ravel piece. You know, that's Pavan. Mm-hmm. I said, when I was a kid, or no, I was a high school kid, Pavan, when I first heard that, it just absolutely captured me. I thought, there's no more beautiful piece than Pavan, you know. And uh, anyway, so I, I just, Martha Boucher was, uh, she just did her. She took me to uh, contests and things like that. I played uh, competitively a little bit, won a few times. Uh, but it, I never really, you know, I, I, I realize now how hard it is to win things. But it didn't sink into me. It's just like it was routine, you know. That's the way she, I, I guess that's the way she taught me, you know. You just go up and do it, you know. And, uh, but uh, then, um, uh, well, oh, she took me when I was a, a junior, you know. So here's the problem. I love chemistry. Chemistry is so exciting. And science. This was a question I was leading. And I to. love music so much. And uh, my dad, you know, he, he, I heard him talking one night. He, he and my mom just talked all the time. He said, you know, I can't see him going into music. I don't want to waste that mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think his mind would be waste. And then he said, I can't see him playing in a bar somewhere, you know. And I don't want that. So, you know, he's, he, he was kind of discouraging it, you know, but he was, he wasn't overbearing or anything. He just, he said about three words in a month, you know, he was a kind of a silent person with his kids, but he, when he said it, you know, you, you knew it was something important. And so, uh, well, anyway, Martha took me to audition with a guy and, uh, uh, it was a music camp in Bristol, Virginia. And there's this this famous piano teacher there. His name was Guy Mayer. I don't know. He was a big man, and big man teacher, you know. So I had to memorize the program, you know. Man, she worked me on that. She, uh, I mean, I, I learned so much on, uh, I mean, just general techniques and music and how to memorize and stuff like that. So we went on the train. I met her in St. Louis, took a train to St. Louis, and she was coming from somewhere else. And so... I got on the train in St. Louis, we took a, the planes weren't very, um, you know, we, it, it was trains in those days more so. But I had this great t- train ride to this little old town in Bristol, Virginia, and um, and so I went to these master classes, you know, and uh, and uh, so I, uh, and I was scheduled to take a master class, but you know, I said, Miss Boucher, I'm scared to death. <laughs> I don't think I could go up there and do that. I just don't think I could do that. And she said, well, I mean, it's going to be so bad. And But I'll, I'll talk to Mr. Mayor. And so he said, okay, I'll tell you what. Just play for me in private. So he gave me a private lesson. Huh. And I can remember this. This is so mean. I can remember him. He'd sort of stand in the crook of the piano over there, you know, and I would play and he would, you know, this and he, I, I was playing this Bach uh, prelude. Uh, it was, I think, it's, well, it's the one in C minor. That, and um, he said, you know, I like the way you play that, but I hear it this way. <laughs> so he said this, and it, I, you know, I said, I hear it as kind of a rustle of wind in the forest, going through the forest trees and stuff like that. I mean. I had, maybe that was something like that. So he says, play it like that. So I played it like that. <laughs> and so, and, um, uh, and I had a Chopin etude and a Beethoven sonata. And I, I think, oh, I had a Brahms too. I had a Brahms Rhapsody. But, uh, so I had this session and, uh, you know, I, I kept my pants dry. And, <laughs> but, um, you know, I was, when I said, th- I was in this master class and all these kids, I mean, they're so amazing. I'm so, you know, I don't like to use that word amazing, but they were just wonderful players, you know, and 
And but I just said, I can't do that. I just can't do that. So, but anyway, so Guy Mayer kind of took me under his wing and he, I, he said, I understand that you are trying to make a decision whether to, how to, how to, what yeah. path to take. Music or chemistry. Yeah. So there's a crossroads there. And I uh, can, so, um, you know, both extremely demanding. I mean, how can I do it? And you know, I was, you know, I was really, this was a hard time for me, really a hard time. And uh, so he said, um, you know, uh, the University of Illinois has one of my students. His name is Foss, uh, what is it? Stanley Fletcher. Hmm. Stanley Fletcher. Stanley Fletcher was really well known too. Yeah, my, just so long ago you wouldn't know any of these names. <laughs> but anyway, and so I'm going to call set you up to study with Stanley Fletcher. And um, I know that, um, that you're interested in going to the University of Illinois because it's one of the top chemistry schools. Yeah, Urbana-Champaign. Right? Yeah, and, and at that time, it was like maybe second in the world or something, you know. And so my dad, since he was a well-known organic chemist, kind of set me up to mm -hmm. go there. And Guy Mayer and Martha... Uh, it turns out I found out that Martha had actually studied with Guy Mayer too, but I didn't know that at the time. They set me up with um, Stanley Fletcher, and so I never took any graduate. I never took any exams to get in any place or not. I didn't even take the SATs. I don't think they had it, such a thing. I just, you know, I just got on you know recommendation. I didn't have to audition to get in the music school either. Simpler times. <laughs> it was. I mean, it's like. And um, and they gave me a, a practice room. I had a practice room, and um, man, a lot. And so I I took lessons with Stanley Fletcher, and um, he taught me. Actually, he wanted me to change my technique, you know, my finger technique. And uh, I could see it was good, but oh man, I had headaches. I would practice and practice and practice to get that technique. I finally got it. But, uh, and he was such a good teacher. I mean, he didn't, he didn't scare me to death. You know, he was I mean, he, he wasn't that kind of a person. He used to have on Sunday afternoon or Sunday evenings, he'd have uh, a bunch of his students in his house over and we'd play for each other. And, and, you know, it was so much fun. You'd play for each other and then we'd talk about what we did and stuff like that. And he had a piano like this only, it was a nine foot. Mm -hmm. And and this, it just about took up the whole room. So some of us were sitting under the piano, I think. And we, we were just, <laughs> but, and he could play. Oh, man, he could play. But anyway, so I had to, so, and then I went to the, uh, the chemistry department. And here I ran into these people who were kind of like, man, these people, you know, if they were, uh, I, you know, they were celebrities, you know. And they were such good teachers. And in those days, you didn't, you know, you didn't get graduate students teaching you. You had the, you had yeah. the, you had the main the person deal. there. And, uh, yeah, I, so, uh, of course I was, you know, I was very, I mean, I, I have to say I was emotionally scared a lot of the time, but, but I kind of, kind of grew into it. And I got to, I got to study with these, uh, these, uh, really great professors, mm -hmm. teachers, and, and in music I got. And so uh, and then the University of Illinois was really, really jumping at that time. It still is, I mean, uh, but... At what point did you begin composing? I... When did I start composing? Man, well, you know, I started right away. This is something, I don't know why. I, did. Uh, I started improvising right away when I was five years old. Mm -hmm. I had a favorite thing I improvised on. And it was the army marching song. So I would improvise on that. I don't know why I like that song. Of course, you hear a lot of that because it was during the World War. II. Sure, yeah. And it's in so, your head. In my head, yeah. So that's that's when I started improvising. And then, um, oh, I know. I I started writing stuff down when I I showed Martha some of the stuff that I was going around in my head. So she. Um, she says, uh, you know, she gave me rudimentary composition lessons. 
and uh, rudimentary theory. She said, I don't want to really do too much theory with you because I'd like you to figure it out for yourself. <laughs> Maybe you <okay. laughs> So, so, uh, if it, you know, I would, I would write my, um, I wrote my junior uh, recital piece and my senior recital piece, you know, so stuff like that. And uh, um, I would enter contests with the, I, you know, the, the National, the Federation of Music Clubs, I was in that, you know. And so I had kind of an active life, but I would, you know, I would, I would, <laughs> so I, I would sort of, I had a little desk up, up in my room and, you know, it was not very uh, kind of dim light. And I insisted on writing in ink because ah. that's the way Beethoven did it, you know. So I had almost, you know, I just had one of these uh, script pens that you use for writing music. And then when I made a mistake, I'd take a razor blade <laughs> oh, <wow. Yeah. laughs> and scrape it off or something like that. And then paste another piece on there or something like that. But um, I had, I mean, I had so much fun doing that. I can't tell you how much fun that was. And um, uh, and then uh, one of the pieces kind of caught on, so one of her students wanted to play it at her. Uh, she was playing in some kind of a contest, so she wanted to play one of my pieces. I said, well, that was Marjorie, and I'm still friends with Marjorie. She's still up there. She's an organist, organist in the uh, one of the churches up there. She, and she was, you know, she, uh, she said, Martha liked you more than she liked me. And I said, no, I don't think so. I think Martha liked you more. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I mean, I had a really full, and so I just, and Martha showed me shorthand way to score, you know, instead of making the note heads, just make a line, you know, so I could just write it down as fast as I could do it. And so I've still got those notebooks. Sometimes I go to them. But, uh, and then when I, I mean, I did it in, uh, I was, yeah, I was composing in when in my chemistry class and stuff like that. I had an amazing experience. Stanley Fletcher went on uh, sabbatical, and so they brought in a, a professor. Mm-hmm. So it was a guy named Sulima Stravinsky. Was so I had a a semester with Sulima Stravinsky. Wow! And um, I was basically a teenager, and I, you know, I thought, wow. But it didn't seem like, you know, I mean, he's, he's pretty good. But um, I remember one time we were arguing over this Brahms, whether it was a slur or a tie. And I definitely said, this is a tie. And he said, no, it's a slur. <laughs> and I <laughs> so I, I finally decided he probably knows better than I do. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but so I, you know, I got to, I got to meet this guy plus a other bunch of guys there. I mean, uh, I ran into Cage, Nicholas, is it Nicholas? Not Nicholas Cage. Uh, John Cage. John Cage. Yeah, and uh, I mean, they were doing interesting stuff there. By the way, there's a book out, um, you know, when we did this uh, song thing that uh, Kevin uh, put on, you know, and I got right. acquainted with a poet, what's his name? Uh, he has a hyphenated name, i think of it in a minute. But anyway, he's the one that, uh, well, uh, each, I met each one of these poets after I had gotten the poem and stuff like that. So we, I got it acquainted with this guy. Turns out he had been in Rochester uh, the time, in the time I was there. And he was, in, he was a curator in one of the museums, I think. You know, and so we could have run into each other. And then his wife uh, ran the admissions uh, window or something in Eastman. So. Yeah. But anyway, he said, uh, he recommended a book to me called, uh, uh, okay, my memory, it's, um, it's, it has a Greek name, who's the guy that went after his girlfriend across the sticks, um, Orfeo, oh, right. Orpheus, yeah, Orpheus. so yeah, the name mean, of the book is yeah. Orfeo, mm-hmm. well, so it was about a guy who was at the University of Illinois and in the music department. And um, he uh, and he named all these people that, that had been there, like Hindemith showed up mm-hmm. one time. What a, I mean, he was a, ama- I mean, he had a real presence. <laughs> and uh, uh, and then uh, 
Cage and I mean like these experimental guys. I remember I went to one of his concerts, which was a uh, oh, what was it? Uh, concerto for five radios or something. And he lined these radios up, and then they carefully tuned them in. <laughs> so then they played something. But we, I mean, it was just fun. And so, uh, but in this book, um, this guy, I mean, that's a real good read. Well, it turns out that he had a kind of a scientific bent. And so he became an amateur molecular biologist, which was just beginning in those days. I mean, it was hardly... Uh, I thought of as a scientist because it was a biology um, study that was started by physicists, actually. Right, right. So, but he got interested in it, and so he built himself a home lab. <laughs> it's a really, I mean, it's kind of absurd in a way, but it was so exciting for me because it was, I had been there at the time that he was writing, this guy's name was Powers, Richard Powers, I think is the author. Magnificent writer. He's a MacArthur Mm -hmm. fellow and stuff like that but anyway so the the long short uh, the short of it is that uh the guy um he <laughs> became a wanted person because the fbi thought he was making some kind of um um poison something, something or something dangerous, yeah yeah so some bio but, weapon. yeah bioweapon yeah i mean it was ridiculous i mean of course i mean it's about as ridiculous as it is as it is now but anyway so he had to go into hiding and all this sort of stuff but it was of course the molecular biology also interested me so <laughs> that was so oh what was this guy Havilland was the the, the last of his name Havilland. Uh, the the poet that wrote he's in town here he okay. teaches at the um, Southwest School of the Arts amazing man but um, anyway so uh, that brings me back to you know but uh, uh, I I mean I did some other stuff at Kodak which was I was interested in um, uh, how how uh, in the, the waste problem waste problem chemical waste especially how is that taken care of in nature so. And I, so I, some of the Kodak's uh, prominent waste, I isolated organisms that would metabolize those waste and turn them into, the idea was turn them into something useful. Mm -hmm. And so I was successful with um, a, a couple of those. And uh, one, I remember one of the, uh, one of the isolates that I, I would grow it on and it made this gorgeous blue color. Just, I mean, you grow in these big flasks, you know, they're like an Erlenmeyer flask, only they're really big and stuff. And it would grow and make this gorgeous blue color. I thought, color, that's what Kodak is all about. So, well, uh, I had to make dog and pony shows for the management because I was always, you know, I was, I was it because there weren't any other biochemists around and, and at that time. And so I was, you know, I had to go to management and I had to go down to the, to the top management, even talk with, with the, uh, this, you know, the CEO guy, the chairman. So I would put on these shows, but one time I put on the show with that color and uh, there was absolutely no use for it, but it was a color and it was beautiful. And those guys loved it. <laughs> they just loved it. And I could never figure out what that color was, but uh, I thought, boy, out of that garbage that we're throwing away we can make this beautiful color but anyway that was one of them the other thing that i was really interested in is certain kinds you know this nature has evolved certain ways of metabolizing materials and and so i i there was a there's a uh, a material which doesn't have i mean it's, it's a it's a synthetic organic chemical and it's called pentarithritol and it's got a quaternary carbon atom, and it means it doesn't have any hydrogen attached to it anymore. It's just carbon to carbon. Mm -hmm. And so it's got to be metabolized somehow. And I said, no, I had never ran into any way that it could be metabolized. So I said, I wonder if it can be metabolized. And so, um, you know, I'm always kind of, uh, I mean, I, I was timid when I was young, <laughs> afraid to play for guy there, but I kind of outgrew that. So. Uh, we lived out, at that time, we lived right near Lake Ontario, maybe a stone's throw, and I had a pond in my backyard. And so I, my daughter was about mm, five years old, maybe. 
And I gave her a mason jar and a spoon. I said, I want you to go out into this pond and kind of go at the water's edge and collect me some mud and bring it back. And I'm going to see what's in that mud. So I did. And it, my gosh, what happened? I mean, it was the most exciting thing. I mean, I'm still excited about it. And that's why I've got a picture of that, one of the enzymes from that. But there was a whole panel of enzymes that you knew, you know, I thought. I mean, for a long time, I thought the organism was a unique organism, but uh, DNA typing became, you know, you had to to, uh, to, uh, to type an organism, you had to go through a whole series of tests. If this is yellow and this is, you know, fizzing, then you do this and that and then, so you have to, there's a man you follow and so you get that and that. So I identified this as, <clears throat> as a certain genus and I named it. I so knew if you have an organism you could discover, you get to name it. So I knew, I wasn't going to name it Good Hue, okay, but I wanted to in a way. <laughs> but <laughs> what did you name? It's it? like um, Escherichia coli is named after Escher. Escher. Yeah, but so I named it uh, Mycobacterium oxidans. No, Carinibacterium oxidans. They're all related. But anyway, uh, uh, what this? See this shirt here? Mm -hmm. I do. This was uh, the team shirt for the team that took this over in Genincore. And uh, this was years after I isolated, but they, they, are, they wanted to, to commercialize this enzyme. So they met yeah. this team Same. shirt. Acyl transferase. Acyl transferase. Acyl transferase. Acyl -transferase. transferase, yeah. That was one of the enzymes. That, that, that was used, by the way, commercially. It, it's really ridiculous to um, modify the dyeing process for blue jeans. You know, so they made it in large quantities, and the Swiss company still uses this enzyme. It's kind of esoteric how it's used, but it's fascinating. I mean, it has a lot of other uses too. One of my, you know, one of my other things was how can I use enzymes to synthesize organic molecules with, you know, the right configurations. You know, that's a big thing now, and I kind of started that. Although I have to say, Ben Volcani is the guy he made but i you know i wrote a book chapter and i did other things you know we used to call it biocatalysis and uh you know i got worldwide <laughs> notice for this so i was kind of a i remember i gave this fancy lecture before i mean it must have been thousands of people in chicago and i was i had to kind of develop a little bit of a theory on some of these things so I was expanding on this as if I really knew what I was doing. And my gosh, I got such a response. This guy, went, he came back at stage after me and says, I want you to come with me to England and give a series of lectures and stuff like that. But, you know, uh, I couldn't do that. I just couldn't do it. I just kind of walked away from it. But, but it was exciting. And, um, I mean, I still get excited about it. But, but this molecule that has no hydrogen, it's quaternary carbon, it was metabolized, and the first thing it made, I got some material out of it, was that it, it was a specially soluble organic acid. And at the time, Kodak Processing, for uh, they were making uh, uh, special uh, dye mixtures and so on, and they needed an organic acid that was really soluble. And this thing just fit the spot. Hmm. And so I had a, uh, I got to scale this thing up, and actually I went to Upjohn in, um, Michigan, uh, Upjohn was a separate company in that time, but they had pioneered fermentation a lot in, during World War II, and that mostly was for making penicillin. You know, penicillin was a big thing mm -hmm. that the fermentation industry, the chemical industry, grew up, and uh, so it was antibiotics and steroids, big, big thing in fermentation. And then the Japanese uh, figured out how they could make uh, amino acids this way. So I visited Japan, of course, <laughs> made a lot of friends there. But uh, so uh, anyway, I hope we're not running out of time. Like, what time right. is it anyway? Okay. Um, but um, anyway, so uh, so this so I they they made I, it was hard to, for me to make any amount of stuff because the uh, this particular fermentation it would. The enzyme would be there for a while, and then it would just lose it, and I couldn't figure out why. Of course, that you know, this is, it can be explained, but I couldn't explain it then. 
But that's how I took it to these masters of the fermentation craft up to I mean, these old guys and they knew just what to do and they made me, I think they made me a hundred kilos of this stuff. And it was made from pentaerythritol and I called it tris acid because it was had uh, it had uh, three hydroxyl groups which made it nice and soluble. Anyway, so that was big and I kind of, you know, I, I sort of earned my keep by doing that and my salary, you know, and stuff like that. I figured they're paying me a lot of money. I said, I got to do something, you know, I can't just have all this fun all the time. So <laughs> anyway, so that kind of, that kind of put me on the map. And um, uh, then, uh, then a whole new thing started at Kodak. They wanted to do clinical analysis. So, you know, I had three careers there, vitamin E, pentarithritol, and clinical analysis. And so, and so why was I in that? Because we used enzymes for the analysis. And so my big thing was to make a spot test for cholesterol and serum, see? Mm -hmm. And it worked. That's not, so, I, I mean, I get patent after patent after patent. I just have to do this and I get a patent. I spend more time with the lawyers writing patents uh, which is an art in itself, but anyway, uh, but the cholesterol thing, it, it was, uh, I thought I had it nailed with a patent, but somebody in England had done exactly the same oh. thing, and they had published maybe six months earlier, and I'm thinking, well, that's the way it goes, at least I was on the right track, but I mean, that became a big business for Kodak, and well, and Charlie, if, if I go to... If I go to HEB or Sam's Club or something like that and I get my finger pricked and they push out a drop of blood and they put it in this little machine with a little lens, did you have something to do with that? Yeah, yeah, I did. And like, I did. So like, they could tell me my yeah. cholesterol immediately. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Wow. And that, <clears throat> that was, uh, we could do cholesterol, uh, fatty acids, um, creatinine, um, we could do uh, ions, you know, like so sodium and potassium and stuff like that and uh, they started doing antibody tests for this so you could uh, <clears throat> you could do um, you know strep throat or something you see so um, and this uh, the business was sold Kodak was you know they were kind of they decided <clears throat> they had put b billions into this but it, the, the crux of it was uh, the reason they got into it somebody had this fantastic idea that they could use their coating machines, which you used to make color film and other film, and coat it with biological materials. So that was a kind of a breakthrough. And they just, they relied on my assurance that they could do it. And they did it. And so we would, and then the other thing is, can enzymes uh, work in, in, in um, surfaces and not have to be in solution? Because you're always, they're always in solution. But when you think about it, the whole body, I mean, you don't have enzymes floating around, they're connected to surfaces. <clears throat> so, this assay work, I mean, it was, I remember when I first saw it, it was just mad, I mean, it was great, exciting, you know? And so, uh, uh, and you know, I ended up hiring people. I had a really nice group of people. I always hired these young people who were really, you know, they were wanted to explore things and so on and so forth. They wanted them. They weren't afraid to try something new. So I had, you know, uh, I hired the nucleus of the biological division. I used to, <clears throat> I, I remember I went to Minneapolis one time for a meeting and I would, you know, in those days we hired people on recommendations from other people, you know, so I had friends in Merck and MIT and and Harvard and other places like that. So uh, we put out the word, you would like somebody that could do this and somebody could do that, you know? And so you get recommendations. So my friends at Merck, uh, what was his name? Uh, just this guy was really amazing. But anyway, he said, I've got this uh, student from India. His name is Prakash. And um, I went, I think he'll fit in with your group. So I went to Minneapolis and uh, to meet Prakash, who became a lifelong friend and um, I could you know we, I met him in a bar and I could and uh, you know the low light mm -hmm. and I could he was sitting at the end from the, uh, across the, the door and way in the back and I just remember this teeth I saw this 
teeth, you know, smiling. <laughs> That's my first impression first, of Prakash. For Prakash, yes. What a what a I mean he was not only not only was he I mean he was brilliant and his wife also. So we hired them both. And uh, you know, they raised a family there in Rochester. And he was a tennis player too, so we played tennis together. And he was uh, my doubles partner. He always took the uh, the ad side on it because he was a hip, he had long arms, and he was so anyway, good old Prakash. And uh, but anyway, and I hired uh, other people. I had from uh, I mean I got you know you have connections all over, and so when I wanted to pursue this investigation a little bit on the side, actually, of waste materials and how to convert them into something useful. I got this guy who studied with a guy named, his name was Brock, William Brock. And so uh, he said, you know, I got this guy. <laughs> I think he'll, meet, yeah, he'll be really good for you. So I got this, and I still, you know, this guy, I, I call him up for his birthday. His name is Bob. But anyway, um, so interesting now, this guy, Brock, he would go to um, places like Yellowstone and he would tramp around in these hot springs yeah. and sulfur places, and he would isolate microorganisms from this. Well, it turns out that one of the our organisms that he, that he isolated, uh, I mean, they, they grow in boiling water or just under yeah. boiling water, okay? The fact is, you find them in your water heater. So don't lick your fingers. But <laughs> actually, they, they're... Uh, <laughs> But anyway, so these, I mean, that life, I mean, it gets into the origin of life. So that was another interesting right. thing. Yeah. Life anyway, so, away. We can so, find life and you know, so, the, the vents at the bottom of the ocean that are letting... Oh, yeah, the, the, the worms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's exciting stuff. But anyway, so so Brock isolated this organism. What the heck is the name of it? I mean, I'm having a hard time. But um, here's the... And then these days you hear about it. A lot. Okay, so you're going to have to get a DNA test, right? So you're going to use PCR. That's uh, the polymerase chain reaction, okay? PCR. Mm -hmm. By the way, the guy that, he just recently died, the guy that invented that, uh, he, he was in my lab for a while. Huh. And he had he had sandals on just like I used to have. <laughs> but he was, a, I mean, he was one of these guys. because he got the Nobel Prize for that. And he should have. But... Um, but but here's the thing. So um, he uh, he invented this, but he didn't invent it for analysis. He he was a chemist and he wanted to make stuff. Chemists like to make stuff, you know. So but he invented this, and so um, Kodak was going into they and, and they wanted to make an analysis with it. So actually, they let's get those guys that invented it, you know. Well, uh, the the polymerase that is used to do this reaction is heat sent. I mean, it, it wouldn't, uh, well, the, the way they cycle is they go up in temperature and then they lower it. And during this temperature, um, raising the DNA strands part, okay? And they mix and match. And then when they come back together, they kneel together. And so it, you do this each time you can double, um, you know, when the, the strands have to be, um, separated before they can be used to replicate. I mean, it's just one of those things. Mm -hmm. And so the polymerase uh, that he was using uh, didn't last very long at the, to higher temperatures. But here comes Brock with his his uh, heat-tolerant uh, uh, organism. So they now they use this... Um, oh, I mean, it's become sort of jargon, but they have this uh, um, yeah, polymerase, which, you know, you can boil it, so made the whole thing commercially possible. So, you, you know, so I had my DNA test last November, you know, and, I, mm -hmm. and there they used this uh, this polymerase. And uh, anyway, so, I mean, I had my foot in. I, you know, I grew up when molecular biology was being invented. And, well, and, and when I was at Berkeley, I rubbed sh shoulders with these guys. I mean, when I... I all the universities cooperated. It's interesting. We we had the University of California by, by uh, you know uh, at Berkeley and San Francisco and then uh, Stanford and uh, I mean there's maybe 
three or four, three or four other colleges there, and, and we have uh, common sem seminars. You know, and people would go into other people's labs, so all the names of the guys that you know really made this thing go, they were there. <clears throat> so I, I, you know, talk about lucky. You know, I I just fall into these things. But anyway, so uh, and then I spent a, a Kodak. <laughs> I was uh, getting too many patents and getting too much attention. I didn't want to go into management, but I was kind of rubbing my some of my management the wrong way. So they said, oh, would you like a sabbatical? And I said, yeah. And so I knew that I had some leverage there. So I said, oh, but I want to take my assistant with me, my favorite assistant. So we went over to the University of Rochester and did some molecular biology with yeast. A yeast expert. He was just my age. We were a week apart. But anyway, he was. So I, I, I did one of the first, um, well, probably the first uh, expression of a uh, um, foreign gene in uh, in yeast. So, so the gene that I expressed in yeast was tuna fish cytochrome C, but it was against the law to do that, I couldn't use the cytochrome C from fish. So, so uh, my professor there, what was his name? I should remember, anyway. Um, he said, synthesize it, make this gene. So I made a gene using a, partly a, a, a machine that made small peptides. And then I knitted the peptides together, not peptides, nucleotides, because I wanted to do that, I had to get the gene. So I made uh, nucleotides, and you could make maybe eight, eight members. So you'd make these eight pieces, and then I'd stitch them together with an enzyme, and then I'd make another piece, and I'd put it in there. And finally, that I think there were about, uh, th this is a pretty small enzyme. I think it had, um, it has 300 base pairs and 100 amino acids. So <laughs> anyway, so I made this thing chemically, and we probably, you know, I, I, so that was one of the first people to make a gene chemically, you know, mm -hmm. and um, but we did it because to get around the the, the national international agreement that you couldn't take a gene from one organism and put it in another. That was that was you know that's GMO, mm -hmm. genetically modified organism. So that was af absolutely against the rule. So that's that's why I'm, I just well we'll just make it. So he he picked cytochrome C because. You can assay for that, and so we took, we inserted this gene into um, a yeast that uh, was deficient in cytochrome C, and if it grew, it had to integrated the gene. So, great idea. And it worked. It worked. It worked beautifully. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, it's not that easy. You have to you have to tack on other things. Because there's start and stop signals, and there's things that say turn right when you get to this place and stuff like that. You got to all add that all to the sure. to the gene. And uh, but uh, I mean, what was his name? <clears throat> I'm thinking Sterling something. But he was a. I mean, he just knew yeast biology upside down and backwards. He was just amazing. That was at the University of Rochester. So I I was a I was an adjunct. A professor of biochemistry there for a while at the University of Rochester, and then I got an Eastman School, so I had two connections. Sure. To the, uh, but anyway, so after I retired from Kodak, you know, retirement was a jolt for me. I didn't think it would be, but I, you know, I was rattling around in this basket, and I didn't know what. I mean, I knew what to do, but I, you know, I couldn't focus. So Margaret says, "Go down." And enroll in the school. I said, you know, but but thank God I did. And um, I went down there, and um, I ran into Sam. Yeah, the one Our of the old first guys, Samuel Adler. Yeah, and uh, uh, you know, and he. Uh, oh no! I, my first thing, the first thing that I did there is I took a summer school, and in composition, and I met I met Sam, and I met. Um, Oh, Christopher, he just died recently. Um, big, big name in composition. 
was it Rouse? Was it Rouse? Yeah, Rouse. Right. Christopher Rouse. Christopher yeah. Rouse. I met him, and of course, the guy that's in charge now, um, Liptek, and a few others, and we just we we had two weeks with each one, and we had to make a composition every day. <laughs> so, so intensive. So yeah, but I I particularly remember David Liptek. Uh, when I took, when it was my turn to my composition, you know, and I rattled it painfully the night before, he put it up on the piano. It was for a piano, and he he lovingly played this piece. I mean, he he with respect, you know. And I'm I'm just a you know a nobody, nothing, you know, just out of the blue. And he puts it up there, and he plays it like it's. Beethoven, you know, and I, I never forgot that. I mean, that was, that was such a gesture, you know. What a, I mean, how can you encourage somebody who's trying to? I mean, this is this is. I mean, this is the kind of people they had there. And then um, uh, after that was over, I, uh, I then uh, the next fall I enrolled in the school, and I just wanted to be in the composition. Said, so, you know, and um, so. Um, I got, um, I had made f- friends with, uh, with uh, Sam and we really hit it off. Mm-hmm. And I what, said, I'd like to... What was the lesson like with him, like in a typical week? Uh, well, um, you have to have new material, number one. And he, uh, we would, uh, he would actually, he would say, um, well, the first thing he told me when I started working, he said, I want you to go to the library and listen to the American symphony composers, you know, from Barber, um, uh, Bernstein. He didn't like Bernstein that much. Walter Piston. Piston. Piston and uh, who else? Who's this guy? He was almost self-taught. Uh, well, I listen. I mean, I just listen. He says, sure. I want you to get your ear into this music. I want you to to listen to this music because... My, uh, you know, my compositions were fairly, you might say, um, tame, <laughs> mm-hmm. but, uh, but, um, so, he, and then he said, um, so that, that was the first project just to get it. And so, um, I had to write, what was that? My first project, he'd give me projects. He'd say, you know, the, uh, I think, uh, he, uh, oh, he said, uh, uh, he wanted me to write a piano piece, but he said, find a piano piece that you really like and and kind of use it as a model. So I liked the uh, the Barber Sonata, you know, that that was uh, all the rage. And then in the second movement in particular, there's a mm-hmm. little figure in there. I can still remember. So I thought, all right. So I came up with a piano piece that was for that. And, um, uh, you know, in... Uh, he he uh, he was very gentle, and he would make uh, some suggestions. You know, he would just and he he said uh, he told me in the beginning, you don't I don't want you to sound like me. I want you to sound like you. Whatever you want to do, he said. Music today is whatever. It does, we're not doing anything particular. You don't have to do twelve tone. You don't have to do this. You know. Yeah. So just do make it. You know, use yourself. But but yeah. you know. So. You be you, yeah. So I brought this piece in, and he he had this amazing ear, and he would say, "What about if you put a sharp there?" <laughs> you know, I had to get used to that because I when I when I uh, took my compositions at the University of Illinois, I, I went into the composition department, and there's a guy putting red pencil on all my scores, and I said, <laughs> "Anyway, handwritten scores." Too. Yeah, he did. Yeah. I thought. Oh. So that really ticked me off, and, and you know, it's one of those things you don't forget. But anyway, so uh, but uh, but Sam um, definitely. I mean, he rarely even um, he changed anything, but more and adding things. But um, and sometimes he would the ending. He say, "I think I hear the ending a little bit like this," and it was just marvelous. It was just marvelous, and I said, "You know." Uh, it's okay if I use that. <laughs> he said, "Sure." <laughs> but, <laughs> On the house. <laughs> but um, and then um, 
One, I remember this one time. I don't know if I told this story to you, but I was improvising at home, you know, and I got going on these lush harmonies. I don't know what turned me on, but I was, you know, I was just reveling in these harmonies, you know, and I couldn't wait to show them to Sam. So I took it into the lesson and I played it and he was standing behind me and I didn't have anything written down. I was just improvising yeah. it. And he started yelling at me. <laughs> I never heard him raise a voice then. I mean, that's the only time he ever did. Never did it again. Yelling in outrage or Yeah, he, he was, no, he was outraged. He was completely outraged, and I thought, what? And then, so it turns out that I was kind of sounding Wagnerian. Oh. And he, of course, escaped right. from Germany. Right. And yeah. Wagner Jews, was the yeah. big, yeah. the big, you know, it was the Nazis idolized Wagner. Right. And he, uh, and so, I mean, he just had a visceral dislike of Wagner because of that. I mean, it was, it was like, poison to him and you know and I I was <laughs> I was shaking in my boots I was, he's five years old only five years older than I am and uh, but then he explained it to me he said you know he apologized he said you know I just um, I'd rather you didn't write music like that <laughs> <laughs> that's fascinating <laughs> and that's so that's the only time he ever steered me out of it anything but you know I would I never had I never had seen so much emotion out of him, but uh, he was an emotional guy, though. I mean, I, I remember when he played some of his pieces, you know, and he would. Mm -hmm. But um, then uh, he, well, he then he gave me a he gave me a, an assignment like write a solo piece for in, instrumental. So I wrote a solo trumpet piece, and of course somebody was there to play it. It was just marvelous, and then. Um, uh, then he set me on songwriting. He said, pick, pick a poet that you like, and I want you to write me a bunch of songs. And so I picked Yeats. Why, I don't know, but I... Uh, something spoke to you. Something spoke to me, and it still does. I mean, I've got this video, I'd like you to see it. But Yeats, and so I wrote uh, about uh, five or six songs, and, uh, and I was... You know, it, this, I don't know what happened, but I had a soprano picked out. I wrote it for this soprano. And they never did get performed for some reason or other. But then uh, then I wrote a choral piece. Now, so he studied with uh, this guy, um, Randall Thomas. Mm -hmm. And so he was big in choral work. And he writes wonderful choral music. Uh, you know, some of his, the things that Sam writes for chorus are just, they're just plain marvelous. So he wanted me to write a choral piece. So I wrote a um, piece for a high school choir. And it had a lot of, um, well, I mean, it wasn't, uh, I mean, it was a little forward looking, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, the harmonies were not, uh, I mean, the, trans, the transitions and the, um, you know, the, um, uh, the changes were not what you would always expect, see, so, but, but we worked it out together and he corrected things that he thought would, and, and words, I forget what the words were for. It might have been, uh, I think it was one of the Yeats uh, poems. Mm -hmm. And, oh, I know, yeah, it was the one, uh, the Song of the Wandering Angus. I don't know if you know that one, but it's got this great line in the end. The golden app, no, the silver apples of the moon and the golden apples of the sun. Right. You know. I've heard that. Yeah. But anyway, so I wrote this for this choir, and I knew the choir director. I mean, there's a really good choir director, and he directed the community chorus, but he also had this high school really good choir. So I printed it all out, parts and everything, and I took it to him, just thinking, well, let's pass Sam's test. I took it to him and. I mean, he was a friend of mine he looked at the score for about 15 minutes and then he just slammed it down and said how dare you give me this music for these students they can never do this piece who do you think you are just coming in here like this you know so that box went out I had a box you know 
I mean, it was stupid of me, but I just thought, you know, he would be so happy for it. But so I put that aside. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, Sam liked it. Anyway, and I've, I've used it in other things, you know. You know how you do it. Of course. Yeah. But um, Recycle your own material. You recycle, yeah. yeah. And anyway, so he gave me, then he gave me an assignment to write a, an instrumental trio. So I... Uh, or an instrumental chamber piece. So I did this piece for horn, clarinet, and uh, oh dear, I was, it had to be flute, I guess. And so I'd never done that before, but I had been orchestrating, you know. I had been orchestrating for this this high school thing. So, I mean, this, uh, this uh, city band, you know, city orchestra. So I... Uh, Trio that was not yeah, not an orchestra. <laughs> so anyway, so I put this trio together. Did you play the clarinet part? <laughs> I should have. I should have. <laughs> well, there. Uh, so Sam saw it and he says, "Okay, I'm scheduling this, and uh, I'm going to conduct it." He said, "So it needed a conductor, mm-hmm. uh, but, but I probably, I mean, he, he thought it. Did. But so he, so he put and he had then one of the concerts." He had these three magnificent students who just could play anything under the sun, and and he he uh, I could just remember him. I said, you know, I didn't believe that I actually did this piece. It sounded pretty good, you know. But uh, <laughs> so I mean, that, that's cool. It's just wonderful. I mean, in my sh- my short time there, really. I I stayed there one one uh, year. And um, and then I, you know, I was, I I really enjoyed the seminars, and they bring in guest composers, so I got to meet a lot of really, really, you know, wonderful composers and stuff like that. And so one of the things I was going to do was I was going to uh, donate some money, and I, one of the things I wanted to donate was um, a, a fund for a, for a financing these these seminars by this visiting composer, visiting composer. Mm-hmm. So I gave them some money for that. And, um, and, uh, but I would go to these, uh, I, I only, I, you know, I'd only go to composition classes, but, uh, I just got tired of being focused on so much. I mean, they called me Papa Haydn <laughs> and, uh, you know, and they wanted to, I, they wanted advice from me all the time yeah. because I mean, I was, I was, kind of a standout because I, I had money, you know, I had a job and I was making, you know, I was making a really good salary yeah. Yeah. and, and it's, you know, it's so tough in music to make, oh, yeah. you know, what, and you so. You had kind of a Charles Ives approach, but yeah. instead of insurance, you were in chemistry. Yeah, yeah. But That's you, it. you had, you had Charles money. Ives is yeah. one of my heroes, by the well, way. I can see why. And I have another hero, uh, Borodine. I was in Russia. Borodine? You know, Borodin was a chemist. Yes, he was. And he I, had, I love his second symphony. Oh, isn't that wonderful? I, I listened to that one probably ten times before I wrote my second symphony. Oh. And I even stole the first three lines of the horn solo Ooh. in his second movement from my second movement. Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure, he, know that, though, I'm yeah. sure he forgave you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but he was, um, you know, he would, uh, he would, he had to sneak time to do it. In the, in the weekends, but he had a he was famous in chemistry enough that he had a in those days if if you had a done something you have a chemical reaction named after you, and so there was the boradine reaction. That's the first time I knew a boradine in the first place. I didn't know he was a was a composer, but um, and um, but you know that Russian group there, all of those people were I mean they were engineers they were. Army, mm-hmm. army people, yeah. and uh, I think uh, Rimsky. Yes, Rimsky Korsakov. He, he was. A, I think he was an army engineer. Yes, he was. So anyway, um, Borodin, Tchaikovsky. Uh, he wasn't in that group, but he was kind of, you know, but they were all. Uh, there we go. So I'd like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> Uh, um, and, uh, and they, you know, they, uh, they were groundbreakers. I mean, like Masorsky, 
people mm, like that. Best yeah. Resorts, Steve. yeah. I'm particularly yeah. fond of Alexander Glazunov. Oh, Glazunov well. too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and there is a. You don't hear much of his stuff anymore. No, he has but a his saxophone uh, concerto. Oh, he does. Mm -hmm. I know he has. Doesn't he have a cello concerto or something? Maybe. Or it's a violin concerto. I don't know. But Glazunov is uh, is wonderful, and uh, uh, there was somebody. Uh, well, I guess there were five. Five of them, but there's one that was really not too well known, and I remember. Yeah, the mighty, the mighty five. Yeah. yeah, so I found I found a, a piano trio by the, with this guy who I can't remember, and when I was at Berkeley, uh, in the biochemistry department, I found a, a really first class violinist who was also in chemistry, <laughs> mm -hmm. and a and a cello player, and so Sunday afternoons we would play trios at my house, and so wow. that's how I got. That's how I got, you know, I kept my fingers in. I, you know, I, it's like you have to do it, you know. You have to do it, and particularly fingers on the piano. But I have to, you know, just, it was a, it was a drive. But anyway, so, uh, um, but Sam, he, he would give me these projects. I had to do, he said, I want a percussion piece. And that's the only, I said, Sam, I don't want to do it. I just don't want to do it, so he let me off. <laughs> but I could do it now. I just didn't think how I could, how could I make anything interesting with just percussion, and I didn't even think of using a xylophone or anything like that. So, yeah, especially all unpitched percussion. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so uh, and uh, so he gave me these projects, and uh, and then uh, at the end of the the year, I said, you know, I just I don't think I want to continue on this. So he says, well, be my private student. Just come and visit me. That's kind. And would and so just bring me music. We'll go over it. And so and he uh, uh, he would actually give me projects too, you know. So I just I I think it was a uh, before I I studied with him, but oh right up to the time I came down here from to San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And when I came down, when it was it came apparent that I was coming here, I went down to uh, Sam took me down to the to the uh, head of the school. I can't remember his name right now. And uh, we, uh, you know, he said, uh, he'd be sorry to see me leave. And he, and I had given donations. Of course. So he said, thank you for those and stuff like that. And then he said, he gave me all the names of all the Eastman people that were in the San Antonio area mm -hmm. and also in Austin. Mm -hmm. So Sam's got a real good friend in Austin. The, uh, what's his name? I think he's in the, he, oh, he's pretty well known. I can't think of his name, but every now and then Sam would come down there and I'd just go up to Austin and see him there. Mm -hmm. well, and, if, you, if you remember, four years ago, really to the day, uh, because four years ago, 2017, it was the Friday of TMEA, and today is the Friday of TMEA. We oh. had Samuel Adler at Trinity. I hosted it. Oh, yeah. And we had yeah. lunch together. Yeah. We came into the Skyline room. Yeah. And so yeah. we all had him. I, I was, that was the first time I'd met him. I'd spoken on, oh, yeah. on the phone with him one time <laughs> prior, but that was the first time I met him. And how charming and he's he so, was and how energetic he was. Oh, he's so he energetic. Was, he was 89 years old. And he's got this time. light in his eyes. Yeah. And, and he's so, I mean, he's so, um, he's just, um, uh, I mean, he's so human. Yeah, he's such a human person, and and um, you know, uh, we met many times, and he uh, he would tell me things that I really don't repeat, you know. <laughs> and then I tell him things too. He said, uh, you know, uh, maybe I go through a tough time, and I'd talk to him about, it. and he'd say, well, you know, da, da, da. but so we yeah. were on that basis. Yeah, and um, uh, and uh, he was fascinated with my science knowledge so sometimes he would say you know can you explain this to me and stuff like that so mm -hmm. but he was so uh, I mean he was I mean he still is I haven't he sends me every year um, uh, a round did he send did he send uh, it, it's a little postcard and he, he has his round for the year so it's a round oh. every year so yeah. people have these postcards with this little tune in and words and so one of his students took about 10 of these and made a piece out of it and uh, sent it to him for a present. Yeah. yeah. But so he sends that out. Have you, but I haven't talked to him on the phone. 
for a while. I've, I've really got to call him. I hope he's okay. He's got to be 92 or 93. Yeah, well, let's see. I'm, I'm, I'll be 89, and he and his birthday... When is his birthday? I've got it on my... I think it's... I think it's spring sometime. Yeah, I'm thinking it's right about coming up. I think he was 88 when we hosted him in uh-huh. February, but he turned 89 soon thereafter. Yeah, yeah. So he's... He's... Uh, so... So... Uh, he, he would be 94. He'd be 94 years old. Wow. I hope he's okay. Yeah, me too. I'd like to see him again. Um, yeah. That can happen. But. He's been down here, here twice, and then... Uh, since I've been here, he yeah, maybe three times. He came. One of his he came once to Casa, right before. This yeah, he came to Casa. I, I was yeah. Here. yeah, yeah, and he he uh, came down to to visit um, not Tim Timothy, but uh, David Heiser. Mm-hmm. Yeah, David Heiser was yeah. having a premiere or something, so he came okay. for that. Charlie, I want to be respectful of your time, and it's, uh, I know you've got we've got things to do, but I really have this one more question for you. And you know, given your long and active career, varied career in biochemistry and molecular biology, and you've had music going parallel with that all this time, and now you're 88 years old, so, you know, be 89 sooner or before too long. I don't yeah, know. April 30th. April 30th, and I know you're quite active playing tennis. You still teach piano lessons. What's the secret? Is it vitamin E? How how does a whippersnapper <laughs> like me become an old codger like you? Well, yeah. I used to I used to tout vitamin E, and I actually I take vitamin E. Do you? Yes, I do. And uh, these days, um, the best vitamin E to take is the natural mixture of they call them tocopherols. I think tocopherols. To call T O C O P H E R O L S. The plants make a natural mixture. And it turns out that this is probably better than the pure. So get that. Okay. Don't get synthetic. Right. Aren't, aren't almonds high in vitamin E? I'm forgetting. Oh, well, wheat germ oil is, is the best source okay. of it. You can just get wheat germ oil or wheat germ itself. It's, it's got the, the best. Uh, I'm not sure about almonds. I should know about that, but I can't say yes or no. So, But anyway, now, what, does, what is the secret? I think... You know, I think partly genetics, mm-hmm. just plain luck, the luck of the draw. Yeah, the cards you're dealt. Yeah, but I also, I mean, um, I think uh, physic- being physically active and mentally active is a lot about it. And good diet, I mean, you know, don't smoke, careful on the beer, little beer doesn't hurt though. Yeah. And... Uh, but I mean, basically, and eat lots of um, antioxidants like vitamin E is basically mm-hmm. that's the main thing about vitamin E. But combined with vitamin C, you've got the really good, really good mixture. And then you know, uh, green vegetables, stuff Clean like that. Yeah, leafy greens. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, boy, when I had that heart attack, I thought, man, I can't believe I'm going to have a heart attack. And I, you know, I asked this guy, I said, were you driving over in the ambulance? I mean, speeding. I said, is this a life-threatening event? He said, you bet you're around it is. You know? <laughs> and so, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, and that kind of gave me a little insight, too, because everybody took such good care of me, and, you know, and I walked out of there three days later pretty good. And... Um, and so now I'm, I'm you know, spending a little time thinking about that, sure. you know, and and when I play tennis, for instance, I got this heart attack because I was playing, we were playing, we didn't have four, so I had, so we were playing one against two, and it was my turn to play, play one against two, and they were killing me, you know, and so I, I didn't like that, so I upped my game, and, and so... My last point, I won, but then I said, guys, I can't walk, I can't sit, I can't, I gotta lie down, you know, and there was this uh, doctor, he was retired, but he said, you know, I'm gonna call 911, he said, and he put my feet up in the air, and he said, well, you got a strong pulse, you know, and stuff like that, you got okay, you know, so. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> he's my buddy now, <laughs> Yeah. but anyway, <laughs> So when it gets to that point in a tennis match now, I just let it happen. I don't go that far. I don't go that extra. But, um, you know, I, I found out 
one of my, I've got um, that one odd artery, coronary artery was 100% blocked and I've got another one that's 20% and another one is 50%. So we're watching the 50% one. I said, well, can't you just put a stand in there? And he said, no, then we don't do that. But anyway, uh, I've got good doctors and um, then I had this arrhythmia and that got all fixed up and so uh, I'm on, I mean, I'm getting my vitality back and I'm getting stronger, so. Yeah. But I think, you know, it's just, uh, man, I've got so many things I want to do. You know, that's probably the biggest problem. I, you know, I, I like to, I, I have this bird project in my backyard. <laughs> I've got so many bird feeders, I can't, some of them I, I just don't fill now because I run out of energy, but, but so I've got that, you know, and, uh. I'm taking singing lessons, by the way. Oh, wow. I'm taking from Gail Wetstein, and it's, cl you know, classical singing. And, well, this has opened up a whole new world for me. Mm -hmm. The whole, the literature of song, you know, I thought it discounted, even though I had projects with songs, with, you know, songs, uh, but <laughs> it's different. I mean, it's the whole world is different. And, cause, and then I became enamored of opera. I mean, I go to, we went to Santa Fe every year, and I... I mean, I mean, I always liked opera. My mother was a singer, you know, and my sister thought opera was, and I thought, you know, she was much more mature than I was. But opera, I mean, I just go to this, I hear this singing and I just, oh my goodness. And I remember reading this essay that m music is not music without the human voice, you know. The, and I can understand that. I mean, he said, that's the first instrument, that's the first instrument and it's really music, and so when when you get these, you know, you can make a perfect tone, and you can oh my gosh! And I'm thinking, here I am, eighty nine or almost eighty nine, and I'm singing. I'm singing. I have this song. Um, I'm singing a French song by um, Fauré. Mm -hmm. It's called Claire de Lune. It's the uh, it's on a poem by Verlaine, and mm -hmm. but it's not the Debussy uh, right. Claire de Lune. But so I got this. And what I do is I, I record the accompaniment. I, I, I'm my own mm -hmm. person. And I just record the accompaniment and then I sing to the sing accompaniment. To yeah. And um, so I, I, this uh, that particular song by Foray is really challenging. But, you know, uh, I knew French a little bit because I had to for chemistry. And then I uh, got a super song. And I, I tried a Mahler song too. <laughs> my God, Mahler. He's so gorgeous, but I mean, it's, I mean, to, to get a good sound, I mean, it is so hard, but I have, you know, I go through these breathing stuff mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, that's like, that's my, my workout, you know, breathing and it makes me, uh, you know, it invigorates me. So, uh, and I think I told, uh, Gail, I said, you know, uh, see, you think I should get a manager? <laughs> but I, I don't think anybody would want to come in here an old guy singing who could barely stand but I, 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 I a lot of times I sit but I, I, that's what I use this music stand for I've just lately got my balance a little bit and I can so much, I, I can get a good sound much, so much better standing up but I mean I'm telling you I'm excited about it and so I reason I took it was I, I've been writing songs you know this project we had and stuff and um, so I thought, i, I got to know more about it. i got to know more about, about the voice and stuff like that. So now I've got things kind of lying fallow and, you know, things happening up here. And I'm going to do some more songs, you know. I've got a, I got this project from this poet who was my sister's best friend in English, and she turned out to be a really good poet. So I did um, seven of her songs. And I put on a concert at the mm -hmm. Tuesday Music Club. I shouldn't have invited any. Well, I probably did, but nobody came. <laughs> you know how it is. But so I got these Barbara Hunter songs, and then she died a year after my sister died. But I have, she gave me, gave me 20 poems, and she didn't give her poems away to anybody. But my sister talked her into it, and so we communicated. And she entrusted me with, with 20 poems. And so I, I have to finish those poems. Yeah. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I took seven songs and I'm going to write one in each mode. So I told Barbara, 
She said, what's a mode? <laughs> I said, well, it's, it's not much. It's just a different scale, you know. But she says she's going to read up on it. But anyway, if, uh, but she passed away. And I wanted to go up to her funeral and put these songs on. And her husband wanted it too. But the family got together and they said they couldn't, they didn't think they could stand the emotional impact because they really liked those songs. So, uh, I owe Barbara um, 13 more songs. Yeah. Well, that seems like a good place to end it. I hope yeah. you keep writing your songs. I hope you keep singing your songs. I hope you have a lot more music left to write, Charlie. And it's been a real pleasure. Thank well, you thank for you very much. With me. Thank you for talking with me. I mean, I know I rambled a lot. No, it's quite all right. But thank you so much. I mean, uh, I was thinking, you know, why me? But anyway, I, I, it's fun talking to you. I, I especially, I've always enjoyed talking to you. I don't know why. You, you are, I don't know why either. You're the, you're this, <laughs> you're, you know, you're, you're just one of these those people that kind of gels with me. <laughs> well, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah. And I like the prop, too. That yeah. That's a good one for this. All right. Okay. Well, let's, let's wrap it up there. Okay. Thanks a lot, Charlie. Yeah. yeah. All right. Press the Great. button. Okay.